Sarah, thank you so much for talking with me today. I am really excited to be talking to you and also to be playing your music for the first time. I've been a big fan of your music, so I'm really excited to get my oh, own thanks. hands on it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm a violist. I don't know if I mentioned that, but yeah, I, yeah. okay. And um, so I wanted to ask you just to start off. I mean, I know I'm a little bit familiar with your trajectory, but just for people who are listening who might not be, um, you've really made a transition to writing for other people from having a creative practice that was much more uh, your own and as a percussionist and improviser and composing for yourself and instruments that you were playing. Um, so I wondered if you could start by telling us a little bit about that transition and how uh, you approached then writing for Talia Ensemble for this upcoming work. So I have always made my own music really since I was a teenager, like 14, 15 years old, alongside playing in bands, um, like indie punk bands or whatever, and um, got really deeply into experimental music as uh, like a 16 year, 15, 16 year old. And then, uh, in particular around that time got really into avant-garde chamber music and had always wanted to write music like that but I was advised by Stuart Saunders Smith as an undergrad who um, I spent some time with as a student to write the piece that you know you can get played and that not to do the thing that a lot of composers do where you like write an orchestra piece and then wait for an orchestra to play it for you but instead write the piece that you know you can get performed. And so I started writing solo percussion pieces um, and I dabbled a little bit in electronics, but it's not really my thing. Like I'm not super well-versed in electronics, even though I love electronic music, but the thing that resonates with me is like acoustic chamber music, um, or I don't even know if chamber music's the right word, but just like, just acoustic music period <laughs> in the, in the avant-garde experimental music world um and so around 2009 i made a lot a lot a lot of solo work either um things that i was playing live or like multi-track recordings of um for either one or two percussionists and i or uh, i think around 2015 a really really great guitarist from chile named christian alviar wrote to me and asked if i could write a guitar piece for him and I, I vividly remember thinking to myself like, oh, I should do this because if I do this, then people will understand that me writing for someone else is something that I could give them. Mm -hmm. And uh, it totally worked. Like I, I wrote that guitar piece and that really was what started the, started the sort of trajectory of, of like getting to write for someone other than myself. And um, that piece of music like artistically opened up a lot of spaces for me that I'm still working in now too but um, yeah it's just gone from there that like I haven't I don't think I've written a piece that I wasn't asked for in like a few years maybe longer um, which is really very nice but um, I'm hoping to like work on some larger projects soon <laughs> but it was right. really nice to work for Talia because I, I wrote a string orchestra piece for the Bard College grad orchestra um, earlier this year. But other than that, I've really only worked with like two to five person ensembles. So when when Talia asked me to do this, I was really um, happy to see that it was a bigger ensemble. Is there a different way that you think about writing for larger ensembles than smaller ensembles? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it's more complicated for sure. And I like strings and percussion and piano are the things that I'm most comfortable writing for. And so just the presence of wind instruments means that I'm like approaching things really differently because I feel like strings and percussion and piano are like touch instruments. And I just have like an innate understanding of that as where I had to write a trumpet piece for Nate Woolley a couple of years ago. And I was just having like a total meltdown because I was like, I don't know what to do with this instrument. <laughs> the, the sensory experience of winds and brass is beyond me. <laughs> but it's, it's nice. Like, it, um, you know, when I was younger, I would say I didn't like orchestral music because it was like too big and there's so much detail in a string quartet or like a trio or something. But then, it, you know, I love Zanakis' orchestral music and now having written an orchestra piece, like, 
the, the sounds that came out of the orchestra were, I like, I literally wept at the dress rehearsal because I like couldn't believe what I was hearing. And it's like, I could never do that with, with a small ensemble. And right. so I don't know if it changes the way I work all that much. It just means that I can do so much more than, mm -hmm. um, than if I just was writing for, you know, two to five people. Right. And I mean, it's congratulations on the orchestra piece, first of all. Yeah, that was it's, a surprise. <laughs> it's pretty incredible that you're saying I used to write like solo percussion because I had the performer right there in yourself yeah. and that you didn't want to be writing the orchestra piece to sit there. But now you're here actually writing the orchestra piece that's been asked well, for. I actually never, I always hoped that someone would ask me for that, but I was mm -hmm. just like, nobody's ever going to ask me to write for orchestra. Like it's just out of the question. And so I had to write that piece under just ridiculous time constraints. And my partner was even like, why are you doing this? Like, like what, what kind of psychopath agrees to write an orchestra piece in two months? But oh my God, yeah. I just like, I couldn't, I couldn't not do it. Like, it was the dream. Yeah, and I, should it ever get played again, which I'm not so sure that it will, <laughs> I would like more time to like, focus it a little more, but I, mm -hmm. the root, the performance was great. And I'm, I'm just so thrilled and like grateful to the Bard program that they yeah. did that for me. That's great. And, and it's interesting because you were saying that, you know, the, the process of writing for a smaller group or a larger group is just that you have more available to you. It doesn't really yeah. change, but also so much of your creative practice has been writing for yourself or musicians who you closely know yeah, um, and are familiar with maybe as improvisers or how their musical capabilities. And so I wonder if that affects at all when you're writing for a larger group and maybe don't know. Um, you obviously didn't know everybody in the orchestra, but even in Talia, it's much more writing for, I guess, instruments rather yeah. than being able to write to individuals. You know, I, I hadn't thought about this until like this second, but that <laughs> I, in almost every piece I've written, I've written, I've really written for like those performers. Like I wrote a piece for the group Beethoven and I wrote that piece with their particular strengths in mind. And the piece that I, this piece clock dies for Talia is I think a lot more insular conceptually that it's just like totally here. And there wasn't a lot of like outside consideration like that where I wasn't like and I think part of it is because there's more people, but there was, and also I just had a clear idea of what I wanted to do with the piece from the beginning, but there was none of this like, oh, Talia does X kind of thing really well. So like, that's what I should take advantage of. And, and um, I, I really love the piece. It really like something really different from what I've been doing, but still feels really connected creatively. Um, that I got a, a, a what I think is a really great piece out of it. So I'm I'm dying to hear it. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Yeah. yeah, I mean, it sounds like it must be really exciting to be able to kind of write in that way where it's just really putting the music in your head to the page rather than yeah, thinking and all actually these other considerations. Starting with that Beethoven piece I uh, called Spectral Mousconsities, I started writing like really intuitively where I wasn't interrogating what I was doing very much is where it used to be I needed like a really like solid hard reason for absolutely every mm -hmm. compositional choice I made and I never would have allowed myself to do that earlier and I just part of it was out of necessity that I just needed to work fast because I was traveling so much and I can't I just find it impossible to be creative while I'm like traveling around playing shows but um I'm writing in this really free way now that feels really good that like, I feel like I've reached a place in composing that I, it, it just, it, this sounds really arrogant, I'm sorry, but it just, it feels like it just is like flowing freely. That, That's great. That, it's not arrogant. It's confident. It just, it just seems like really intuitive to me what the right thing to do is with any given piece that I'm doing, which, which feels really nice, but also because I'm not like, setting up any of these weird systems or having like really specific ideas um, like that, I'm getting these pieces that are really strange that um, wouldn't have happened if I was being more rigorous about like pre-planning or whatever. Mm -hmm. That Like the, this piece for, for Talia was written, I wouldn't say on the fly, but I was really like making compositional choices like 
while I'm literally like poking them into the computer <laughs> like, or it's just like, oh, I could do that. And then I could do this. And, and I don't know if other people work that way, but um, I definitely wouldn't have felt like I should do that like five to 10 years ago. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the dream probably for anyone in any profession is to feel like you're getting into a flow where things are, are easy and coming out well. Yeah. Um, well, now that we've mentioned the piece Clock Dies, uh, which is being premiered on the 23rd, correct? Yes, yeah. the 23rd at the Time Spans Festival. Um, is there, could you tell us a little bit about the piece? Yeah, I, it's loosely inspired that I had done a little bit of reading about um, circadian rhythm and that like, because, you know, I've made all this music with repetition and um, in particular with this piece of mine that I really like deeply care about called the reinvention of romance where it's 90 minutes of just these like very simple repeating patterns and the kind of gesture of that music is like oh you have something simple that's repeating but the longer you listen to it the more complexity and like information you realize is there and I've done that a lot and so <laughs> I felt like I wanted to get away from that kind of repetition but one of the things that I talk about a lot when I talk about that piece is that the, a big inspiration for that piece was that I realized that, and this isn't like my own original thought, but that like repetition is occurring at like literally every level of our lives from like biology to like the earth circling the sun, that like everything is repetition based and was, I don't even remember how I got on to circadian rhythm, but I, th oh, it was about, I was reading about, um, like bipolar disorder and some other mood disorders that um, are can be like regulated by um, sleeping in a really regular way, and that the and I'm not a scientist or knowledgeable about this at all, but that what what I had read is that actually humans and mo you know any like most animals are on a circadian clock that like they sleep at a certain time and they're awake at a certain time and that like regulates how their brains work or it has to do with how their how our brains work and but there are people that like whatever's happening in their brain is not synced up with the 24 hour clock and so i was thinking about like wh what is the condition of 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 living you know with a a broken clock essentially mm -hmm. um so the 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 title is not um mysterious <laughs> <laughs> Um, and so that was sort of the thing that was new for me about this is that the piece is very repetitive, but that um, a lot of the repetitions are sort of intentionally broken. So like they're mm -hmm. repeating, but they seem broken. <laughs> um, and Interesting. It, it goes off in its own weird world. Um, yeah, like it to me, and I'm I'm thinking of all of this as I'm saying it right now because I, I you know I haven't even heard this piece yet, so I'm not totally sure how I feel about it. But there are these moments of like really intense. I don't know if clarity is the right word, but the, you know, there's one moment of the piece where just all of the musicians together are like, <laughs> and that I feel like one of the one of the um, uh, one of the byproducts of like having a messed up clock, which me means that your highs are way up here right? and your lows are way down here. And so it, instead of working with regular repetition and working with like repetition that kind of goes up and comes down, if that makes any sense. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah. And I really, well, I'm, 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 I'm verbalizing all of this for the first time right now, as I'm saying it out loud to you. So I don't know how articulate I'm being. <laughs> no, no, it, it's very clear. It makes a lot of sense. Um, it gives me a little, I mean, I've been looking at my part and looking at the score a little bit, but it's nice to kind of put this I, idea to it. Right. And like um, the individual instrumental parts are like pretty simple. Like the, mm -hmm. the string parts, a lot of it is just like half notes, but the composite piece of the seven players together is something really complex built out of things that are really, really simple. Right. Um, well, thank you. And I like can't wait to start rehearsing it and for everybody to hear it on the 23rd. Yeah, me too. <laughs> um, this, this really brings, I, when I was thinking about this interview and I kept, and I was listening to your music again and I'd listened to it before and this idea of repetition like you're talking about is so prevalent 
and so much of your music, whether it's like very large form or these smaller chunks here. Um, and it made me really think about our current state of the world. I was kind of like, do we need to talk about this? Do we not need to talk about this? Has this been talked about enough already? But but I do think that it's maybe worth talking about because we are in this moment yeah. of being, I don't know, mid pandemic, early mid pandemic, nobody knows. But mm -hmm. I, I was thinking about how, you know, my perception of time and repetition has changed so much in the past year and a half um, where we weren't really doing our normal things and the idea of like living a very repetitive life became so real to us and i think yeah. there have been so many articles about how our brains process time differently once we're not activating them in all of these different ways yeah um, and so i was wondering if you had thought about that at all with your music or if this feels like a different type of repetition or how, if any, I don't know, whatever this is, if this is bringing up anything for you. It, like, it certainly obviously has affected me in the way that it has affected everyone. And like, I, I work with a great composer at Bard College named Matt Sargent. And yeah. both of us have children who are right around the same age. Like uh, my kid is two and his kid is six months older than mine. And early, early pandemic, like, you know, we all lost our daycare, school jobs, like we're all just home and nobody wants to go outside because we don't want to get sick. And right. I remember I was texting with Matt one day, I don't even know what we were talking about, but he was like, yeah, we've just accepted that every day is exactly the same. And it really, that was really hard for this household at first. Mm -hmm. And I would imagine, I mean, that's not unique to us as hard right. for everybody to just like, everything just stopped. And just the the way that time passed this year really the, for reasons that are not just the pandemic for me but like having a kid and trying to teach on zoom and and all of this stuff um it it just has i feel like i don't even need to say these things because everyone's experience is the same to just to say that like the past year and a half has been like experientially very strange from a time perspective but creatively like I've been asked this question before and I'm not sure if it the only thing that I feel like has changed for me is that I've been writing a lot mm -hmm. and not playing at all which um I was really sad about for several months and then I just sort of settled in because because like this is I played a concert we have a gallery in our garage here I played a concert okay. here um two weeks ago and that was the first time I had touched a vibraphone in a year or something and like I think not, I think I know that is the longest that I have gone without performing publicly since mm -hmm. I was like 12 years old, um, wow. which is crazy to think about that. I just performing is such a, it's just such a huge part of me and just something that feels so good, which worries me a little bit that it seems like what I'm doing in my life is getting more and more pushed into like composer land and farther and farther away from, from performance land. But, um, you know, I haven't made any new solo music in like three years because all of my energy has been going into these other pieces that I'm obviously like really excited about what I'm doing, but um, it's just a change. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't play in bands anymore, and all that sort mm -hmm. of thing. but I was, I was talking to a friend earlier today and I, I, I said this as a joke, but it's kind of true. I was like, well, my, most of my music is already about isolation and death. So I can't say that the pandemic has really affected me all that much creatively. Right, the themes were still really on point. Yeah, it, so I, I settled right. I've, I've been in a, a creative, creative period. <laughs> hey, I mean, if you can uh, roll with it, then that's great. But I, I've been, I've been, really lucky that like I still have a job and that people have been asking things of me musically mm -hmm. during this time so I I haven't just felt like totally you know in a pit musically or something that I've actually to my surprise written like quite a bit of music in the last year so mm -hmm. I haven't heard any of it but I would <laughs> like to <laughs> you will hopefully someday soon yeah on the 23rd yeah I I think and, and when I was thinking about these ideas, a lot of it had to do with the listener experience, which like you can't necessarily answer as composer. I don't expect you to have the answer to that. But but maybe that like, you know, there are always people who enjoy 
long pieces, right? Or long, uh, like slowly moving pieces. And I'm, mm -hmm. I'm one of those people. Um, but so many of us this past year have experienced this life that's like so slowly moving with these, these small transformations over time that are like maybe microscopic. Mm -hmm. um, like if, if one day you don't eat your eggs, I don't know, and you have a bowl of cereal, <laughs> like every change is so small and in so many ways that really to me resonates with a lot of your music of, of the, just making um, small transformations that feel so powerful when they're in at such a, a large scale. Um, yeah. And so I would, I'm really curious to see how this piece resonates with the audience there. Um, and it's yeah. so fortunate that we get to have actually a live audience for I know, the first I'm, time in so long. It's amazing. And I honestly, when I was writing this piece, I was like really putting a lot of energy into it. Um, not just energy from like how much I was working on it, but like musical energy into like making the piece something that I thought would be really powerful because I was just like, this has to be awesome because it's one, it's going to be the first thing that I do since the pandemic started. And now since I had that thought, things have changed. And now I'm like, this might be the last thing that I do for a while. <laughs> I hope not. But um, yeah, I just really, I, I, I feel really strongly about this piece. And I felt that way when I was making it, like it really, it was kind of an intense thing to write. And I was also trying to do it, um, I was trying to finish it in sort of a frantic space because we were leaving town for a long time at mm -hmm. the end of May. And so I wanted to get it to the group before then, but um, I don't know. I feel like it's, it, the piece is like very of the moment in my my life specifically, although mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm sure in other people's lives too, of feeling like kind of overwhelmed and, and weirdly occasionally ecstatic, but also kind of like stuck in a sort of fucked up thing that you right. can't get out of. <laughs> a very emotional roller coaster where we're yeah. not quite sure how time is functioning anymore. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You're like, has it been two weeks or two years? No one knows. Yeah. Um, but I really, I was, I, the main inspiration for the piece was this idea of, of like someone whose biology is in con conflict with mm -hmm. like the, the, like, uh, everyone else's natural biology. Yeah. Or not even biology, biology and like experience and socialization and stuff like that. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I mean, it sounds like a really fascinating um, concept. And so I think it will be interesting to hear it come to light for sure. Yeah. Um, I was, we've talked a little bit about ensembles and writing for different sizes and coming from a more original improvisatory and like band uh, creative practice. Um, I was wondering, probably with this uh, orchestra piece too, is the first time you're really having conductors interpret your work. Yeah, that's um, true. And, and how how that's been with for you, um, if you've had any thoughts about that? It's been really nice, actually, because, you know, in general, I feel like I'm pretty self aware that like, once I have done a certain type of thing enough, I don't want to do it anymore, where like, mm -hmm. you know, around a little over 10 years ago, I was making a lot of these pieces of just like one sound repeated for a long time. And it, I reached a point where I was like, I don't need to keep doing this because I feel like I've learned everything that I need to do, uh, everything that I, everything that I could have learned from this and that I, and then I move on. And these two pieces happening within the same span of time has been really nice because even if I hadn't been asked to do these two pieces, I really wanted to get away from using a stopwatch for everything. Mm -hmm. Um, because I, uh, you know, this sounds ridiculous, but I had not made like a through composed scored piece without a timer. <laughs> not ridiculous. I mean, it's, a... I don't, that, that's not like a hundred percent true, but it's basically true because mm -hmm. you, you know, I'm doing all these repeating patterns and so much of what I was doing was like, we're just going to sit here and then we're going to find out that actually things are moving around, even though we, it feels like we're in one place and musically this piece and the orchestra piece, I feel like have a much different approach um, where they're still very like sound based and they're doing things musically that still feel very connected to the kind of music I've been making, but 
um, you know, I want to get asked to do things that I haven't done before. And mm -hmm. so it, to me, I just saw it as an opportunity to write a different kind of piece. Um, and it, I actually, it, the main difference is that the amount of time that it takes to make the piece is a lot bigger because, you know, okay. re, my piece, The Reinvention of Romance is 90 minutes long and the score is like, you know, four pages or something because it's just little cells with times next to them. Right. And, um, I don't have a problem with that, but, um, you know, I just want to like do the thing that I haven't done mm -hmm. in, gen in general, because, you know, it was the same when I wrote that guitar piece that really put me somewhere else creatively because I'd been making these loud, you know, knocking pieces and repeating sound pieces. And I was just like, well, I can't do this with the guitar. Like the thing that I like about these pieces is not going to work on an mm -hmm. acoustic guitar. And so that was what gave me the idea of like, well, what if I repeated patterns instead of sounds? And I made that piece and I was like, oh, wow, I'm really like somewhere else now musically, but it feels totally connected to the thing that I was just doing. And I really feel that way about this piece for Talia that when I was making it, I'm like, oh, this is something like really new for me that grew out of the pattern thing, which grew out of the single sound thing. Like it just mm -hmm. feels like- It's um, evolution. It's evolution, but in like, I don't know, the metaphor I was used is the, uh, that when I made these pieces uh, around 2009, that I like jumped into a pool and the longer I make music, the pool just like keeps getting bigger, but I'm still in the same pool. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really, um, I've, I, I mean, I don't want to do my artist talk at you, but I really, the, these pieces that I made in, in, for myself in 2009 called Psalms, like I knew it when I made them, I was like, oh, this is it. This is the music that I have been looking for mm -hmm. that like I knew I was going to make and I just didn't know what it was yet. And I still feel like that gesture of playing one sound over and over again and realizing that the world inside that thing is so much more than it seems is still like a core gesture of like literally everything that I've done. Yeah, I don't think that's disappeared ah. in your music. No, it's just like expanded in different ways. Yeah, totally. Um, could you you've mentioned the orchestra piece a couple of times, it would be interesting to hear a little bit about that. Does it fit in closer to clock dies or closer to some of the other things um, you're writing? It's kind of its own thing. Like, okay. <laughs> I knew that I, I um, mentioned earlier that I like really loves Anakas's orchestral work because he mm -hmm. wrote for single, you know, there's an individual part for each member of the orchestra. Right. <laughs> and I just thought, wouldn't it be amazing to be able to do that? And so it was really, I informed by that, like, oh wow, this, the score has, I think, what's the number, like 32 individual parts or something. And the opening of the, the, Sometimes I have an idea that informs the piece and sometimes I have a sound that I then have to decide like what the idea is so I know how to compose the piece. And that piece really started with me saying, I want to hear 32 people playing 32 pitches um, with a uh, Colegno Trato Boeing okay. as, quiet as, as quiet as possible. And the, this is when I, when I said I wept, like I heard that and I was just like, this is the most amazing thing I have It ever sounds heard. beautiful to me. It's, yeah. It's incredible. It, like, and I don't say that like about myself. I say that about like the sound that mm -hmm. it, it's just unbelievable. And I also knew that I wanted to have 32 people playing 32 distinct repeating patterns at the same time. Um, so the piece kind of goes back and forth between those two sorts of things. Um, okay. But it's pretty different from, from Clock Dies uh, musically. I mean, it's like I've, nothing I do is that different from anything else I do. <laughs> but um, it was informed by the really specific situation of having an orchestra um, and that there were two sound worlds that I just really, really wanted to hear. And then I crafted them into a piece that seemed to make sense to me. Okay, very cool. Um, yeah, I think with the orchestral playing, so is that, you said the Bard Student Graduate Orchestra? Yeah, it's called right. uh, the Orchestra Now at Bard Oh, College. with the Orchestra Now. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah. And um, how was that experience of working with an orchestra? I know I'm in a, 
I play in the Albany Symphony, oh, which right. plays a bunch of plays a lot of new music, but still for an orchestra to play newer um, works is sometimes uh, a little bit of a struggle sometimes to get everybody on board and moving. Um, but did you feel like there was a, uh, a strong connection to your music from the performers or did people kind of get the idea? They definitely took it really seriously. And mm -hmm. James Bagwell, the conductor, was was really prepared to rehearse a piece with 32 parts, um, which was amazing. But, you know, in the back of my, I remember, I don't remember who said this. I read this in college. And this was part of my, like, I don't like orchestral music kind of thing when I was in my 20s, which was that I read something that was like, in the orchestra, it's the only situation where like the majority of musicians can openly hate your piece and it still comes, it still comes out really well. Right. And like, I went to a big state school for undergrad and I played mm -hmm. in the orchestra and I, I loved playing in the orchestra, but, and you could tell when we did any new music, which was not often that there were a certain subset of players who were like openly hostile mm -hmm. to the piece. And it didn't feel like that at all. That's um, fantastic. Which, I mean, which, which was really great. Yeah, I mean, Bard, and especially that program, is a pretty um, progressive school. So I yeah. think they're, they're but it, honestly the the only thing that I would change about it is that I wish I had more time to write the piece mm -hmm. um, because it I, I loved it and we got a great recording and the performance was great. But I would really like the opportunity to really like like there were some things when I heard them live that I would do differently because they didn't do exactly what I thought they would. Right. Um, but, it, you know, the piece, if it never gets played again, the piece is great as it is. It's fine. <laughs> I mean, and it's such a privilege now to even hear music live. I know I, <laughs> I, I, my partner and I went to the concert and we were, um, I was one, counting her. I was one of four people in the audience and the other two were employees of the orchestra. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but even that it's, yeah, it's very special these days. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned how, especially, I mean, in the past couple of years, you've been working more as a composer than a performer, and that especially this past year when none of us could really do much performing, yeah. it's um, switched a little more to that same balance. So are there things musically that you are looking forward to and like fingers crossed in this upcoming year as a composer or a performer? Um, I, the one of the things I really, really want to do is work on a very large piece. Like there's a, a French composer named Jean-Claude Eloy who made these pieces that are like two, three, four hours long. And there's one in particular called Yo In that's played by um, percussionist Michael Ranta with um, electronics and it's three and a half hours long. And I just, I'm just like amazed. It's like one of my favorite pieces of music ever. And I really want to do something of that size. In the past five years, I've made two pieces that I was not asked for. Like I did them just because I needed to, that I, I knew that, that I was excited about them. And those two pieces are also the two things that I think are the best things I've ever made. Mm -hmm. And so I do have like the seed of an idea for a big piece. It's just, that's different because those other pieces I like knew I could get performed. And I'm not sure I can get a three to four hour piece with a large ensemble performed, you know, anywhere. Right. <laughs> um, but I want to just do it because I want to, um, mm -hmm. because, you know, it's like I was saying earlier, I just want to do the thing that I haven't done before. And I feel like I've made a lot of 30 minute pieces for small ensemble chamber music now that I still like doing, but I would like to do other things. And I'm just such an admirer of this three and a half hour percussion electronics piece because of the way it's paced. I would love to do something with, with um, really large forces that's not um, confined by like a certain kind of ensemble, like the orchestra. Um, mm -hmm. Something with like lots and lots of things going on at the same time, basically. It's like but, an, almost like an operatic scale. Exactly. Without, without I voices or, yeah. hesitate to use the word opera, but I am, I, I don't want to say anything about this yet because I don't know what's going to happen, but I am potentially working on what they call the collaborative opera, but I have literally zero details about it other than mm -hmm. they asked me to do it, but that is something that might be happening, which would be really great. I mean, I think it sounds like a, a pretty uh, intense 
musical experience from what you're describing of having this like totally uh encompassing three to four hour piece that just yeah like, i mean it'd be away. amazing it's like you mm -hmm. you know you would leave the concert hall like literally changed yeah um, you know, you could watch two movies in that time. <laughs> <laughs> or one movie at the rate of right. the, 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 I feel like every superhero movie now is like three and a half hours long <laughs> <Right>. anyways. <laughs> yeah. Go see your work or go see a Marvel. And, and so I, I just, you know, I'm sure I will reach a point where I will no longer be interested in just like longer and longer durations. Um, but I don't know, I'm not, I just kind of do whatever I feel like doing mm -hmm. at any given time. And that, I mean, I like, set myself up that way many years ago to that I I like I'm in a position now where I just do whatever I want creatively and and I feel free to do whatever I want um mm -hmm. which is I mean that's like when I get the like what's your advice to a young composer question it's always my answer is position yourself so you can do whatever you want creatively <laughs> because uh, you know what am I going to say otherwise like right you, you know try to get a job or whatever like get your doctorate and try to get a faculty position that like you probably won't get and because like nobody gets them like, no it's pretty impossible these days yeah like one out of hundreds of people get those and and it's not to say that you shouldn't try but all that that the thing that i think is 100 percent attainable is to position yourself so that you can make exactly the music that you would like to make um, yeah um, that sounds really exciting, though, and I, I would not cross off the possibility of someone bringing that to life. I think yeah, there's a I lot mean, of, a lot I, of if, uh, exciting possibilities now. If I didn't think it was somewhere deep in the universe realm of possibility, then I wouldn't yeah. even be thinking about doing it. But I feel like maybe like this, I could make this happen with. I definitely think so. I think especially from you know so many of the conversations i've been having with other performers coming out of this period of not performing is that people are kind of like evaluating what type of music they are feeling mm -hmm. like compelled to play and and sometimes i've i've noticed a lot of <coughs> people being like i am less interested in learning these 5 million notes and like executing everything <laughs> to this like perfect degree yeah. Um, and really, and just like having these meaningful musical experiences. Um, yeah. And maybe that's just us finally taking a step back from our busy lifestyles for a minute and getting to relax. Feel like not yeah. everything needs to be so intense. Yeah, who knows? I, I feel like I just, even without the pandemic, just kind of like live on the moon. And so <laughs> I, I'm just like doing what doing whatever is in front of me. <laughs> that's great. I just, I'm lucky that people are asking me to do things. I've, I'm still even, you know, many years into making music. I'm really grateful that um, people are interested in me, basically. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm very happy that Talia was interested in you and yeah. got you to write this piece. So I think yeah. it will be such a, a beautiful addition to the concert. Yeah, and I had a piece performed on Time Spans two years ago that it was just such a great concert. And mm -hmm. um, I was, not only I was thrilled to get asked to play it right for Talia, but also that it came from Time Spans. From Time Spans. Uh, yeah. And the Earl Brown Foundation. I was really like honored that that happened. It's a it's a pretty incredible festival. Yeah. Um, and brings so much like really amazing music to the city every summer. And so yeah. it feels it feels very special that it feels like the the return of events is through the Time Spans Festival, at least totally. for contemporary music in New York City. Do you have plans to perform more in the future? Are you interested in doing more solo work? Yeah, I mean, I I I love performing. It's just it's just not um, well, it's not been possible, but it's not what right. I'm getting. It's not what I'm getting asked to do, and I'm mm -hmm. just generally, even before we had a kid, it was I was really like at my limit of like what I could do, and I I did nothing but essentially tour for two years although I was writing all that time too and it was about 50 percent presenting this film piece of mine and 50 percent playing solo shows and um I I would definitely I would love to keep playing concerts again but I do you know I've made like literally 10 years worth of vibraphone music and I'm a little bit I'm finally after that amount of time I'm like I think that maybe I want to put this instrument away for a little yeah. while 
And a part of why I haven't made new solo music is I just don't know what to do right now. That, that was what um, I was curious about too, is like moving to more of these larger through composed scores and everything, if it it's, you know, making you kind of rethink what it is you want to do as a solo performer. Mm -hmm. I more, I just feel for better or for worse, I just feel like solo performing has just been kind of put over here mm -hmm. for a little while, which doesn't feel great, but I'm so excited about being able to make music that I couldn't make by myself that um, I'm not not interrogating it too much. Uh, yeah. Just to say that I, I would really like to be playing concerts again. As would we all. Yeah. So hopefully we will uh, all be back there on the stage soon. Yeah. Um, and then I guess you have this, you were talking about this dream you have of this uh, big, big piece. But it seems you'd mentioned that you were headed to a residency next week, which seems like it's probably for a more tangible project. Are there any things in the no, no, okay. No. Just curious if there's anything in the works you wanted to talk about. Um, there is. Um, there's a CD that came out um, a few years ago called Reservoir One, mm -hmm. and then <clears throat> I got a commission from the flutist Claire Chase right around the same time for a piece that I called Reservoir Two, because within a few months of each other, I got asked to write a piece for piano and three percussionists and also a piece for flute with a vocal ensemble. And I was like, oh, well, both, both pieces are one of something and a group of something. So I mm -hmm. declare this a series and had this idea to write three pieces that were all an hour long and all uh, in sound worlds that didn't interfere with one another so that you could play the pieces separately or simultaneously. Oh, interesting. And. The first one is written and recorded. The second one has been performed, but not yet recorded because of COVID. And I just finished the third one for strings um, for violin and four cellos like 10 days ago or something. Okay. And I really, I'm, I really, really want to get that finished. I mean, the piece is basically finished, but the thing I want to do is record them. And I mean, the dream is to get a performance of like, musicians scattered all over a big room playing these these three pieces at the same time mm -hmm. um but i would settle at the very least for like a box set with all three pieces <laughs> and then a fourth disc with all of them at the same time um and so that's going on and like i'm writing a piece for greg stewart who's one of my best friends uh who's doing a solo percussion album mm -hmm. um, we play in a trio together called meridian right. with uh, tim feeney and I don't know. Those are the only I, I like I finished this piece for Talia and a couple other like re this Reservoir 3 and a couple other big things. And I'm I'm sort of in a period of like, I don't really know what I'm I mean, I certainly have plenty of things going on, but I don't have right. a, thing, a thing right now that I'm like really hot to do. Like I don't have any deadlines. Sometimes that's the best place to be. It yeah. helps you figure out what's next. And it's funny, we're, we're leaving tomorrow for this residency. And mm -hmm. yesterday I was like, yeah, I don't, I don't know what I'm going to do for a week. Like, I don't have anything going on. And then today I made a to-do list of like, here are the things I could work on. And it's like a mile long. So <laughs> there's always more to do. It's not all composing, but it's all like related to music stuff. So mm -hmm. I just, I, I have a lot going on. Um, which I don't say to brag more to say that I'm just like barely above water at any given time no. <laughs> as a human being, but um, it's, it's good. It's nice. Um, and I guess one other thing you've been teaching at Bard, right? This past year. Yeah. This will be my third year. Third um, year. Okay. Starting this fall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was wondering how starting to um, teach has that <coughs> changed at all? Um, how you approach music or how are you, how have you been connecting kind of your compositional practice with your teaching? I don't know. If, I don't think I have really, I, I feel like I'm still like learning to be a teacher because mm -hmm. it's just not I, in the same way that I had to really learn how to rehearse an ensemble. It's not in my nature to like be an authority figure. <laughs> and, and of course, you know, I had to rehearse ensembles for two years. And so I feel really confident about that mm -hmm. now and I feel like going into this third year of teaching I'm like ready to um like do I mean I've been doing a fine job but I feel really like um prepared in a way that I haven't mm -hmm. been in the last couple of years but I just feel and this is the same with the pandemic question I just feel like whatever work I have in my head is so insular and like specific to whatever weird thing is happening in my brain right. that, that 
it, it's just, it's like happening on its own on some other level. And that's not to say I'm not influenced by like what's happening around me, but um, it, it, you know, the longer I get into a practice, the more like focused on what, on whatever it is, mm -hmm. it, it becomes. And, and um, it just feels like it's its own, it's happening on its own outside of, of I don't know. I just feel like teaching is, is I love it and it's awesome, but it's like my job currently. It's a and, different, different track. Yeah. And I mean, I'm a working musician and like composing and performing is also my job, but like, you know, getting paid to essentially like be yourself is, is very different than like going somewhere and sitting in front of students and saying like, here's the history of the West German electronic studio or whatever. Right. It, it just, it's like, it's just different. I don't know. Even beyond that, I mean, I imagine that these students are going to come out with such a interesting and really special view of music from having studied with you. Yeah, and our our students are, are cool too. Like yes. people are coming in as freshmen and you know making noise music and stuff. It's amazing. So you you found a place where you can really uh, affect and infect the youth. I guess absolutely. <laughs> Um, great. Well, I, um, unless there's anything else that you would like to talk about before we wrap things up. Um, so this was we, nice, nice. Yeah, chat. covered a lot. <laughs> Just a casual chat. But um, so excited. Are you going to be at time spans? Are we going to oh, see yeah. you there? Okay, I'm great. actually I'm I'm coming straight to a rehearsal from this residency. So you'll be so, so relaxed and then drive in through New York, which has tons of traffic already and uh, yeah. and get I can rid of all that relaxation. <laughs> un unleash a crazy two year old on the Domena Center. Yes. <laughs> um, well, we cannot wait to have you in rehearsal and for us to begin to play your music and hope that everybody uh, comes to hear it um, and we'll be performing the premiere on the 23rd. Yeah. So thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah, thanks a lot. I'm I can't stress enough how excited I am to hear this piece. So awesome. It's good. Well, congratulations on this piece, and hopefully this will be uh, just the beginning of it for sure.